Kentucky native. I'm a multimedia artist and a poet as well, or a, a striving poet, a student of life. Um, I was sharing with the panel just before we came out that I'm a three-time combat veteran in the United States Marine Corps, and uh, while that is not um, a particular aspect of my life that does in fact define my life, but it is a very significant uh, sounding board or a, a starting point for um, where, I, where I am today in my life. I had some very profound experiences during uh, that time of my life and, and uh, it's led me to being an artist and to being here with you today. Good morning, I'm Nat Urban. I'm a uh, member of the faculty of the University of Louisville Business School. I teach in the MBA program. I teach two courses. One is called Managing in the Future. I'm a futurist, you know, I've been studying the future for the last 35 years, and I, as I said, I teach a course called Managing in the Future, and, um, and also a course of leadership. But also work with Chris Kimmel and the Idea Festival. I'm the founder of Travels, and I'm looking forward to engaging with you about this great topic of good group things. I love that idea. <laughs> I have two microphones, that's interesting. <laughs> I don't know, but they both work. That's fantastic. Good morning. Uh, I don't manage in the future, I manage in the present, so we're going to have a good conversation. Um, I'm Ted Smith. Uh, I have uh, a couple of hats and no hair. Uh, my first hat is uh, I'm the Director of Economic Growth and Innovation for the City of Louisville, so I work for Mayor Fisher. Uh, and in that capacity, I'm very interested in the interplay between um, the public, the public realm, the private sector, the nonprofit sector, how all these things all work together to make a place uh, special and vibrant. So I'm very much looking forward to this conversation. The other hat uh, is the University of Louisville Great. Uh, Executive in Residence uh, hat. Uh, and so I'm very interested in uh, sort of hand-to-hand, -hand, not combat, but hand-to-hand -hand engagement with uh, entrepreneurs in our community. And, you know, in my past life, uh, started and sold companies, and uh, it's very near and dear to me. So I'll keep my figure down sturdy. And my name is Will McAdams, and I'm a community-based theater maker. So I create local plays based on original local stories. I spent two years directing the Apprentice Intern Company here. Are there any apprentices or interns here? Yeah. <laughs> we didn't make it early on Saturday morning. Um, and one of the things that I love about Louisville is, and what was really inspiring to me when I was here is the decades-long uh, history of community organizing that um, a lot of folks who really transformed Louisville and, and were my mentors, the Fairness Campaign at the Braden Center, and many other places who really were, for me, doing the, the, the work that is about transforming communities, and I'm just kind of tagging along for the ride. I'm Gil Holland. I'm an art style entrepreneur, I guess you could say, because I'm a film producer, run a little record label, a music publishing company, and do some uh, real estate down on East Market Street. Okay, thanks. Um, we have an interesting topic uh, this morning to talk about uh, the idea of, of can communities, how can communities um, really come together and, and influence change. And I just wanted to start it out by putting some context into this. I think we, uh, and then basically open it up to the group to start the discussion. Um, we live in an interesting, uh, certainly an interesting time, uh, and particularly with a lot of the new technologies that are, um, have been come forth, and certainly um, in the new media and things like Twitter and iPads and iPhones and all the things that that, that involves Facebook, uh, creates um, uh, certainly tools for collaboration, um, tools for coming together for good and sometimes not for such good things um, that are kind of unprecedented in, in the world. Um, and so it's, the, the platform is there for a lot of interesting things. I think we also live in a time with, um, obviously, with where resources are, are quite limited and the role of government is certainly changing. Uh, and I think what government can, can you know, do and not do sometimes is, is certainly, <coughs> certainly changing as well. And there's, you know, there's a lot of talk nowadays about um, crowdsourcing, um, maybe, you know, and crowdfunding uh, and collective intelligence and the ability of people to come together and that that amalgamation of people it results in what's called emergent intelligence, and that is that the group uh, together is in fact, you know, emits intelligence, um, uh, direction, wisdom, whatever you want to call it, um, much more powerful than the individual parts. Um, we've certainly seen parts of that happening in, in the Arab world over the past, past um, uh, year or so. And so it's not that it's, you know, I'm not placing a value saying it's good or bad, but certainly these things are, are, are important. Uh, in a city like Louisville, we have a lot of challenges. Uh, it's, 
part of Kentucky. Kentucky has a lot of challenges. And so I'd like to start out by just asking everyone um, their thoughts on uh, is it in fact, uh, what do you think about crowdsourcing? What do you think about collective intelligence? Uh, does it have a role in making Louisville uh, a better place um, in, in a meaningful way? And I don't just mean some of the simple problems, but some of the, some of the more difficult problems as well. Whoever wants to start. I'll, I'll start just because I think that for years, decades, centuries even, there's been a top-down, you know, authority has come from the top down, you know, the Pope down to the people via the churches, the energy companies top down, you know, big distribution centers, uh, you know, near New Orleans have been distributed across the country. And then I think in the last five to ten years, with the, you know, Obama's re-election, with the fact that, you know, the traditional media is also kind of going away, I feel like there's a great opportunity for lots of ground sourcing of ideas and change. So I feel like never before has the individual had such power. I'd like to add to that, um, Gil. The other thing, think about the time in which we live, is to understand, too, that um, this change is, is not just in Louisville. This is global. Within about three or four years, you know, we have a population of the planet that's 7 billion. We'll have about 5 billion people will be connected to this, this idea, this whole emerging intelligence. So what you find is, and, and why I think this is important for our community, is, is thinking of, of seeing ourselves as being isolated is not feasible. Uh, we have to think in terms of this intelligence as being part of something global. For example, um, as the world becomes more connected, now we have new tools for solving medical problems. Uh, I read a really interesting piece the other day about how we're solving the issue of AIDS by crowdsourcing, by using gamers, because we have previously expected that it would be only the scientists. But now we have young people, 17, 15, 13 year olds, who can use computers in a much more efficient, efficient way than maybe uh, they've ever been used before. And you've got millions of these young people who've got extra time on their hands with these great minds, and they're actually helping, helping to solve problems in the lab. And that's just an early example of how this sort of cognitive surplus that we have, that we have not used, that we're going to use. And so it's not just a matter of thinking about the city of Louisville as if it is restricted by the uh, Ohio River. The city of Louisville will be in context of global changes itself, and the people in Louisville will be connected with people all around the world, some of whom who have never heard of us, some of whom have never heard of, uh, 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 who have never uh, shared an idea uh, with someone from Louisville. But our next generation will be doing that. And I think that's the most exciting thing about the whole idea of thinking about group thinking crowdsourcing. Well, let, me, let me just follow right on. I completely agree with that. Um, and actually, I think it sets up a kind of a paradox for us because you know, never has the world been so flat in our experience as a species. And so that's great. So we can all be connected to all sorts of um, bigger things than us, bigger things than our city, bigger things than our state, bigger things than our country. Um, and so that's great. No doubt about it, that's great. I think it now raises a kind of an issue, which is, well, then what happens to cities, states, and countries uh, in a, a civilization that's all connected everywhere, right? And so I actually think there's a, a kind of a challenge for us is we celebrate the local. We all live somewhere. And um, there are no rules of the road uh, for uh, where are the boundaries? You know, where, what is our identity? I mean, I would argue as a guy who works for the city that, um, you know, there's far greater affinity for the University of Louisville than there is for the city of Louisville. And you know, it's a daily challenge. You know, when you get up in the morning, you say, well, how do you get up? Do you get up as a Louisvillian? You know, do you get up as a new you know? As a cardinal. Uh, magnet? <laughs> do you get up there? What, what do you get up as in the morning? And, and I think um, this is going to be one of the great challenges we have, which is we may have to redefine the value of local. And I would actually argue hyper-local is probably the biggest competition to local. You know, I, I, don't, I don't lose a lot of sleep worrying about affinity to Frankfurt. I lose a lot of sleep about, you know, what's your town, and you know, like these are these are important new uh, kinds of conversations, and uh, you know, I, I'll be interested to know how we sort of hold it together, because it was just a county when it was born. And I would say, because the issue of what a border is becomes very contested in a moment like this, and I'm working right now in the California, in the Central Valley, 
and it's an area that was the home of the migration of Dust Bowl folks. The graves, part of the graves of wrath, were set just in the town next to where I'm working, uh, and it's now 95% Mexican and Mexican American. Many people who are, uh, came from the border, over the border in this generation, many people who came generations past, and there is incredible tension between those two groups. And I would argue that one of the main reasons that folks who um, are afraid of immigration are afraid is because they sense how fundamental that transition is that we're at the midst of, and it's terrifying. And so, I mean, for me, people are always moving across borders and always from the beginning of our country and will continue to. So it's a, to put it in a larger context, it may not be as scary, but I think that the intense anti-immigrant sentiment and rage and racism and fear has a lot to do with people truly sensing those, that shift and not knowing what to do and being afraid of, of what might be lost. I think um, really in terms of the, the youth today, uh, harkening back to uh, America uh, post-war 1950s, uh, the beginning of the so-called beat generation, moving into uh, the hippie movement, moving into punk rock and, and kind of where uh, the youth happens to be today from a counterculturalist and very creative perspective. Um, I, I think that one of the more uh, sort of punk rock things that someone can do uh, today is to go to their farmer's market uh, and to, to buy local and to be an integral part of your community. And I think that honestly, if you hit the streets and talk to a lot of the youth today, you'll find that uh, precisely what these gentlemen are so eloquently uh, speaking about right now is, uh, is kind of coming up you know, through the roots into the youth of today. And that, it's, that, um, that crowd, everything from crowdsourcing to um, multimedia and how you use social networking and uh, attending your farmer's market on Saturday morning is something that, uh, that the youth um, are, are really behind right now and ever increasingly uh, more so. Uh, I think one of the, um, I think one of the interests that I have specifically as an artist along these topics is um, there's a, a local group called the Center for Neighborhoods, CFN, and uh, I believe you can look them up on centerforneighborhoods.org. Uh, Hallie Jones is a good friend and the director there. And my wife and I, Shelly Von Halsey, who happens to be in the audience right now with us, uh, she and I collaborate on a number of, on, of artistic projects, and one of the most um, interesting aspects of art in the 21st century to us right now is uh, the idea of art incorporating technology, social networking, um, and medias, and uh, being experiential. And we developed a project through the Center for Neighborhoods. We unveiled it last year. Uh, Mayor Greg Fisher was there to pull the curtain off of this large sculpture that my wife and I created. The project is called Push the Envelope, and uh, long story short, it's a very large, oversized, pop art style sculpture of an envelope addressed to the universe, and, uh, and the return address is a specific community within Louisville. It's the return address is from Germantown, or Schnitzelberg, more specifically. And this envelope is um, a place where people are invited within the community, whether it be Schnitzelberg, Germantown, or all of greater Louisville, to go and visit this sculpture and to uh, place a thought into it, a note, uh, almost uh, as if uh, the experience that I had when I was in Jerusalem and visited the Wailing Wall and saw people uh, write a note or a prayer or a thought or a hope or a wish for their future, for their family, or their community and place that into the wall. There's a metaphor uh, imbued within this project called Push the Envelope. And when people come up to the, to the work, they can place something inside of it. How they do that is on, to, on the left of the sculpture and on the right of the sculpture, there are two slots. Uh, on the left, it's labeled private, which means that it's between the person who writes it and the universe. So it will never be read um, by the public. 
but on the right hand side it's a public slot and when they place those comments into the slot it, it's completely democratic you can write whatever you want anyone can place something in there and then once a month we go to the envelope we empty its contents and post that online and via a blog and Facebook and a number of other things and uh, it's really interesting the comments that we're receiving and how people want to have their voice heard and um, and sometimes it's very personal and sometimes it's very practical and utilitarian it, sometimes someone may have the idea that perhaps a stop sign on the corner of such and such road is a good idea for pedestrian crossing and that maybe the city ought to look into that and it gets deposited into the envelope and everyone can read it and um, fortunately Mayor Greg Fisher has been very interested in the project and uh, people are, are using it for what it's intended for. You know one of the things about um, Matt, just back to the point he made, it is kind of interesting, what he was referring to as a game called Folded, which was developed at the University of Washington by, um, it's a game, basically a game-based strategy to help people, to help scientists understand how proteins fold, which is a key in a lot of diseases and things. And one of the interesting things was there was a, a group um, that, a, a scientist that had been working for 10 years um, trying to understand a, how a particular protein was misfolding relative to AIDS. It was a key component in China to understanding something they were doing for a treatment. Uh, and they had been frustrated for 10 years, and so they decided to give Folded a chance. And the gamers uh, solved it in 10 days. Wow. Um, that's a great example. Yeah, that's, that's, and the Pierre Levy, who is the French philosopher who coined the phrase collective intelligence, has a great, you know, he said something I think was pretty, pretty profound. He said, you know, nobody knows everything, I'm paraphrasing, uh, but everybody knows something. Um, and I think what we're talking about in terms of community Whatever that, and I like that, whatever that community is defined, and, and I think the first thing you get into is, well, you know, the geographic de definitions probably aren't relevant anymore. I don't know what, what is, but they're probably not. Is, is how do we, you know, how can we bring these things together? One of the things uh, I want to ask the group um, is, it's one thing, um, you know, to do things and give people opportunities for input, and that's certainly one way of, of, of bringing people in. Um, but there is something else that is um, that operates at this kind of edge of chaos. It's not completely chaos, but it's not um, that organized as well. And that is, you know, how do you use these kinds of strategies? Can you use these strategies in a way to really effectuate meaningful change? Um, and one of the things about this as well is that these kinds of crowdsourcing strategies, by their nature, are unpredictable. So there's always a little bit of uncertainty and danger in these kinds of things. Not necessarily danger being a negative thing, but it's not like a mayor or somebody getting up and saying, okay, I'm going to do this, everybody give me your thoughts. There's That's also the same. often some danger in that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I mean, how do we so how do we how do we take what you're what we're saying here and how do you apply to that? How do you actually apply that to a a, a community of people, and that's really what we're talking about. Well, I, no, I was just going to say that uh, I love that danger, really. Actually, I think that um, it's particularly true for boomers. Boomers have this idea that they know everything. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and what young people ought to ask boomers sometimes would be, if you guys are so smart, why are things so screwed up? That's what young people should ask boomers. <laughs> And one of the things that intrigues me about having crowd intelligence, crowdsourcing now is I am, and I am always encouraging, and I get this from my MBA students, but also working with young people in high school, is we need more revolution on the part of young people challenging the status quo. And I expect that they will be. For example, I, I, I just cannot believe there's anybody in here who does not think that young people could actually redesign our educational system better than it is now. And they could do it in two weeks. Okay? I mean, they could literally redesign it in two weeks. They could redesign the way we do government better than it is right now. They could do it more efficiently. But boomers are in the way. Our attitudes are in the way. We think that we have inherited the right to be able to do things. It's great for the past, but I don't think it works for the future. And I think that's one of the things that keeps us from moving forward. And it's also one of the advantages for having a community about the size that we have because you do have to have, you know, there are some restrictions when there are restrictions and limits, you can have more freedom. And I, 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 one of the things I'm challenging our community to do is get 
young people involved, more young people involved. I think we should have all the high schools at, at the Idea Festival. We should have high school young people at Manual. If, 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 you know, if you work with any of those young people there at Central and Manual, we have some brilliant minds. But we ought not think of them in terms of just being high school minds. They're just minds, M-I-N-D-S, and they are just brilliant. So we're going to have to start thinking about, I think, Think differently about the surplus, about the intelligence that we have within our community, and start to use it. We're not using it. And, they, and these young people can really help overall us to think better about social, political, economic, technological powers, all of those forces. They can help us do this better. But boomers have got to come to grips with it. Let me just go over no, I'm just I'm going to take one issue. I, I, one issue with, with Matt. So just a boomer. Yeah. Say, not Matt. <laughs> I do know I'm here, by the way. Um, at least I told my daughter that she doesn't buy it. Um, one of the things, I, I mean, I think you're right to one thing, but all, here's the other problem, though. All, basically, and in, 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 in really we're talking about systems. You know, whether they're social systems or natural systems, they operate the same way in many respects. All systems basically, in a sense, are engineered to some degree uh, to come back to the status quo. Right. Right? They don't like to be agitated. Right? It's, you know, so uh, let me just throw this out, and I'm just going to stop there. But to say, I don't think it's, it's, it's much more difficult and complicated than one group saying, we kind of know it all, therefore we're going to resist. The system itself is designed to resist change. Yeah. That's how things survive. And they, That's right. Well, I hope you'll indulge me with a, a two-minute experience in groupthink right now. Is that right? Yeah, sure. go for it. All right. So um, but one of the things that, that it, my work is often asking and other people are asking me is crossing borders and crossing boundaries. And I think this was particularly relevant in, in such a, in a in Louisville being such a segregated city. And so there were a lot of folks who crossed lines of race, of class, of sexual orientation, of gender, of ability to educate me. And those, those are the people who, who inspired my life and my work. And I bet each one of us has an experience like that, or many. And I think if we share those with each other right now, that there's an opportunity for learning among this group of people. So what I'd like you to do is turn to someone either next to you or around you who you don't know, and tell them the story of one person who crossed the boundary in that way to educate you or inspire you. For example, for me, uh, we were working in Highview, and the associate pastor of Highview Baptist Church, uh, we, I approached him. And he was incredibly welcoming of me, of our company, of our process. Um, we have very different views of the world, and he knew that going in. But despite that awareness, he was able to kind of cross the line to, to welcome us in, in a really genuine way. And so what I'd like you to do is to find someone and tell a story. You use their name if you can, if you remember it, or if not, that doesn't matter. But just take a minute to exchange that story.
or thinking, you know, Jeremy Rifkin has that great book, The Impact of Civilization, that the more connected we are with the rest of the world, we realize that we're all on this planet together, the more environmentally you know, friendly and conscious we will act. So I think the uh, boundaries that you discuss are really all in our minds now. Let, let's use this opportunity now to open it up to everybody now in the conversation. So uh, just raise your hand if, if you want a question, want to make a comment. Um, yes, sir. I, I'm really interested in, in the process for, and, and I watched now, I watched theater change just over the years between where you buy a play and you do what's on the printed page and people come to see it, to where we were most recently creating uh, Tom Sawyer, and what happened was that both the actors were part of the collaborative process in terms of bringing out the ability to tell the story beyond just the story that we know in terms of right. uh, Tom Sawyer. So what happens in terms of the, how do we train people or help them become equipped with the skills necessary to become facilitated managers of the process so that people can be brought together in a collaborative group? Because pe some people think right brain, some people think left right. brain, and many times you need to bring it together. Did everybody hear that question? Okay. The question was, you said from the, using the theater as a context, that the theater has changed dramatically over the years. And, um, it is evolving continually, and so one of the from that he was saying, how do we bring, provide opportunities and safe places for people to come together, right brain, left brain, etc., to really engage in this participatory process? And let me just want to make, following up that one comment about young people uh, today that is very different, that is germane to this conversation, and that is uh, this generation that is has come of age uh, of recent, um, they are not, you know, they are not content being passive observers of anything, whether it be theater uh, or, you know, they, they watch TV and they text together as they're watching TV uh, and things like this. And I think one of the challenges to this is, is to realize that we're going to have to figure out ways to allow people to, to participate in the stuff we're doing because they're not content sitting around and, and, you know, and saying that's why gaming is such a powerful incentive for people because it's a collaborative it's interesting because it's a collaborative experience, and there are, you know, in most cases there are no monetary awards, rewards for people. The reward is simply collaborating with people and getting a rep in the game. So, I mean, I mean what, what are your thoughts on? Look, that? I, I have some uh, uh, a lot more than we have time for thoughts on that. Um, <laughs> so, so I think when we when we have these conversations, uh, you, you go to the place that's sort of you know sunshine and rainbows and unicorns, and it's all a wonderful thing. And why why have we been getting in the way and you know leashing all this up, right? And, and I think you know the, the bottom line is it's a brackish period, right? So um, to have a great idea that you're going to go and have a concert in the lobby of Humana actually is still not really possible. You know, it's it's corporations, private corporation. You have to navigate that, right? So the the sort of free spiritedness still bumps into regularly institutions that we've had for a very, very long time that aren't always so obvious. So I'll just give you an example. When I started in July uh, as the director of innovation for the city, <clears throat> I had a group of young entrepreneurs say, um, you know, how do we put the zoo on Google Maps? You know, I, you know, I move out my phone and I can't figure out where the penguins are, right? I mean, it's actually very easy. Google makes it very possible. But, you know, Dick Cheney's house and the little zoo are not on Google Maps. And so you're right. You know, where's the monkeys? Where's that? And, and, you know, I'm like, what a great, you know, gosh, we should go solve that problem. You know, and then, you know, and I'm not going to throw anybody under the bus in city government, but let's just say that the idea that a bunch of people are going to come in on a volunteer basis and do that work is not allowed. See, that's ridiculous. You know, but, but it's, not, it's, it's not allowed because the only people that have ever done that kind of work before were threatening a workforce. Okay, so this is where values truly collide. So, you know, organized labor, which is about protecting workers' rights, you know, is actually sort of, a, you know, becomes a problematic element of, well, you can't just volunteer to do stuff, you know? And so I'm not here to, you know, no value judgments on, you know, labor, you know, corporate management and all that kind of stuff, but you should recognize that this happens every day of the week. But and see, it sends a message. That, and see, that's exactly the class because what we now know from research, and, and Chris, you alluded to this, is that the thing that motivates us most will have nothing to do with money. And, that's, and this is what we're finding from crowdsourcing, is that this is the reason why people will come together to create new computer languages without being paid. 
read an interesting piece. Somebody said, look, I'm going to present, I'm going to present a business model to you. Um, what's going to happen is, this was, say, 10 or 15 years ago. Here's the business model. Uh, I'm going to propose that um, millions of people are going to come together. They're going to create an encyclopedia. They're not going to be paid at all. They're going to stay up all night to do it. And this is going to be their reward in and of itself. Of course, that's Wikipedia. <laughs> and, uh, and why is it that people will do things without being paid? Why is it that people will do this for the zoo? Because it has some value to them. They're motivated intrinsically, which is one of the great things about the time and why group think is possible. But it does require attitude. Well, well, that's, that's, more importantly, it requires a whole lot of extra work. Right? So, yeah. so when you meet the, the, the fence, yeah. the question is, will you rise to take down the fence? And in my practical experience is, there aren't a lot of people that rise to take down the fence. So you know, I'd rather go play somewhere else. Yeah. But I think, I mean, and just speaking, artists are often asked to do things for free. And on, on, on behalf of the larger institutions that make money. And I think that that's, it's a tricky place. And it's also a tricky place for community-based artists who've been kind of creating kind of the kind of facilitated leadership that you were, were uh, describing, Jack, for, for decades. And now we're at the point where that work is becoming mainstream. And it's a, it's a point, it's a moment of possibility, it's also a moment of co-optation, because a lot of the larger institutions are able to have access to, to funding streams that a lot of the folks who've been doing that work don't have access to. And it's a time of great collaboration. It could be as something really transformative, but it could also be for folks who, who feel like they've created the work and, and doing it for free, and now there's maybe money available to make a living doing it, feel isolated. So I think just to say, well, people just do it for free because it's intrinsically valuable, doesn't it, I, I mean, I think it's a lot deeper than that. I'm sorry. Yes, yes ma'am. Front row, first I'll give you. Um, I work in a public library, and if there was ever an institution that figured out how to do more than you thought you could on less than you ever thought you could have, <laughs> <laughs> um, and at some point, um, e knowing that all of that group work is going to produce wonderful activities, you do hit the reality of, of money pretty quickly. And just an example uh, is a person who uses my library often, weekly, three times a week, who uh, got in the habit of coming into, into the front door um, for months, and the first thing out of his mouth was to the front desk staff with a smile, well, how are you all going to steal my tax money today? <laughs> every single time, every time he walked in the door. And it, maybe it started as a joke, but it sure didn't sound like a joke after that. So at some point, all the good work you do has to come against money. And so, and, and, and in our society, in our economic times right now, that's talk about brackish and, and scary. Um, that, that's a reality we have to deal with. Can I say one quick thing? Um, I, you're actually correct, and and this isn't a criticism, but I think it's it's back to this back to this notion of things. I mean, there, there are there are ways of doing things that, that have to evolve as well. All right. For example, I know that the library right we can't charge for anything. Well, maybe that's one of the things that needs to change. Because we all have money is a reality. We, we you know we all have to figure out a way of being able to pay for the things that we want to do. Um, and and I think that's that's an example of uh, I know we've come across a couple times and we've you know and the thing is it doesn't mean you have to charge a lot. But I think again as we move into these different kinds of, of times, the days of us being able to set things up and having people pay for them are probably over. We have to figure out creative, and artists are very good at that. Figure out ways, and entrepreneurs are good at that. They have to figure out ways, here's my idea, here's my passion. Now, how am I going to get people to buy this? And I think all of us have to realize that that's part of this creative new way of doing things is going to have to come into play. Well, um, really from socialism to communism to capitalism, all these isms uh, that we live under are ultimately based upon infinite resources and uh, really there are no infinite resources uh, especially not while we continue to burn dinosaur bones at the rate that we uh, that, that we that we are and um, the, the sun itself not to be uh, 
ultimately negative because I tend to see the glasses half full. Uh, but uh, but the sun itself is a is a giant light source with a with a, a lifespan, and so uh, you know there are really out of the box different ways that I think we are only on the verge of in the 21st century of of really discussing where that the, there is a new system uh, yet unforeseen that we can live under and that there is a different kind of value to be placed on something other than um, currently how we view it within the capitalist society of the almighty dollar. Um, as you were talking about, sometimes the, um, the need or the desire, the want to do something uh, individually or collectively because the soul is, uh, excuse me, the whole is equal to the sum of its parts. Uh, that sometimes the desire to do something just for the intrinsic value of bettering oneself and their community and the joy that comes out of that is, is uh, a payment rightfully in and of itself. And, uh, and I find too, <clears throat> with the, the talk about you know, artists, uh, artists, educators, library, uh, you know, that there's this whole field that is really grossly, I believe, underappreciated uh, within the capitalist society that we live in. A good artist friend of mine uh, just made a t-shirt that says, uh, exposure doesn't pay the bills, um, which uh, I'm getting exposure right now, but uh, you know, um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a fact of, of life of, where we where we currently are, and um, I think that you know it really even within the artistic community you find a lot of people going back to a bartering economy, which is really interesting. It happens all the time. One artist will uh, barter with their local framer to uh, uh, services rendered uh, to in order to have an artwork framed so that they can. Uh, show it in an exhibition, and uh, various things like that. So there are different ways of, uh, of placing value on things. Yes, ma'am. I find a need to give my thanks and gratitude to this young man that he found a need to speak about his Marine uh, days in the Marines. Our country gives you our thanks for us being free. We're free. The men and women over there die for this freedom, and I want us to never forget those people that are dying and serving our country. My son-in-law just came back last year, four uh, tours in Iraq, and he's at Fort Bragg now, and he says, I hope I never have to go back. I know what they go through. They eat sand. It's 140 degrees in the sun. So God bless you, and stay healthy, and stay alive, and right forever. <laughs> Can I just answer the, the, the guy who asked, you know, how you're stealing his money? I would say, well, did you get here in a car? Did you walk on streets that were designed by people that probably learned something at the public library? Do you, you know, work in a building? This building was designed by people that learned things in a public library. The food you ate was probably, you know, inspected by somebody who learned something at a public library. So. Yes, ma'am. I just find this all very hopeful, and I have messages for my adult children along the lines of, um, you know, in great times of economic distress and that kind of thing, some of the best ideas come about because people don't have anything else to do but just to think. And we've got pretty much everything we need. We've got root, the basic needs met. Not everyone, of course, but, you know, the vast majority of people that you're directing this to do have their basic needs met, and they have time on their hands to start doing some of this. So they're willing to do it for free if it's going to benefit themselves in some way, or I don't think we do things so much anymore for fame and fortune. I think there are a lot of really creative minds. Just listen to the TED Talks, you know, and I've turned Absolutely. my kids on to TED Talks, and they go on all the time, and they find these interesting things, and they post it and pass it on to their friends, or the Idea Festival, I think, is a good example of some of the ways we need to start changing that thinking. But I also work for a very uh, corporation, and you know their ways of thinking ha are very slow in coming. So and I'm a creative. I'm you know an artist. I have been for my whole life. And so some of my ideas come up against resistance. You know, and until I stand on my desk and start yelling like the Lorax, I am not all prepared. <laughs> and so you know I I'm the crazy one. But um, I like that. 
I think it gives me, it keeps me out of fear. And I think fear is a, a big factor in keeping people repressed and not coming up with these ideas. So we just need to continue to that conversation. And I just want to say, our, for me, the whole arts education, it's not so that our, you know, when all these kids grow up to be 25, they can, you know, smoke filterless cigarettes and read Sartre, but, you know, please thank you. It's, it's so they will have creative minds to, you know, invent the next Google and the next Brown Foreman 150 years from now, you know, so it's all, it's, for me, it's all about entrepreneurship, creative thinking, because that's, you know, most of the people, most of the kids today are going to be working in companies and industries that do not even exist today. I saw it. Jane? Uh, I just think it's interesting that we sit here today um, within the last 48 hour period where one of the most huge crowdsourced things ever happened around the world, which is Coney 2012. Yeah. Okay? And I, as I posted yesterday, whether you agree with them or not, they got tens of millions of people around the world to watch a 30 minute video mm -hmm. and then do something. And the vast majority of them were young people. So uh, my, I guess, and, and now, as I said, you know, I looked into it. As soon as it started to roll, the naysayers started coming in, right? Well, they don't spend much of their money, right? No, 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 no. So no matter what your trajectory towards success, there's going to be people clawing you down, okay? So um, I found after the, now we're into the third day of this cycle, uh, we're getting some truth out of GuideStar, and they're saying, yeah, they're, they were a new nonprofit, but they spent 80% plus of their money on what they're doing. And yes, the guy is still out there doing bad things. And, you know, yes, we do still need to keep pressure on Obama. So the main parts of what they were saying were true. And so I wonder how, and, and this relates back to even kind of a selfish point, but of the work that I do, I'm looking for ways to teach young children to be discerning consumers of social media, okay? And for them to use social media as a tool to help them rather than the other way around. And also to look for ways to use the virtual to facilitate the real. I still want you to go and meet your friends and be with your friends and you know, um, all of you guys work on a project together. So I think that's a dilemma that we looked at as we you know, start to get um, the education community a little pushback of any time you wanna introduce some new um, a technology or whatever. I'd like to know how you think we can free those little minds. Well, well one thing, let me just make a quick point. Um, it's interesting you said that because one of the one of the things we do, we feel very strongly about with the Idea Festivals. We do a lot of social media stuff, but it's still about it's still fundamentally about bringing people together. Mm -hmm. um, and and it, it's you know, so we feel very strongly that I mean, I feel very strongly. We all feel very strongly. Ideas have to be discussed. Uh, and they have to be discussed among people. Social media, new media, is, is a wonderful venue uh, to help do some of that, but there's still no, no excuse, which is one reason why with IAC University, several people have said, well, when you get these classes together, are you going to video and put them online? And the answer is no, we're not. Because we want to create a space where there is no video, there is no podcast, there is nothing but five or six or seven or 10 or 15 people sitting together talking about an idea that's important to them. And, and, a, and a space to do that, and they don't have to worry about saying something and finding it on YouTube the next day. Um, you know, you know, humiliating them or something. Um, and so I, I think that's I think that's a, a very good point. And there's the other thing is there is all of this stuff we're talking about takes work. Being an educated person is work. Learning how to use social media properly is work. Being a great athlete is work. Um, being a creative person is work. It, it, none of this, you know, this idea that somehow it's an aid and it just kind of flows from us from the, from the universe it is not true. And I think with a lot of what you're saying, Jane, there are ways of doing that, but it's work. I mean, we have to find techniques to educate, to inform, to encourage, to persuade people um, along these kinds of lines. And they, they you know, they just don't happen um, because they're, they're good. Let me just make one more comment and I want to pass the mic on. Um, when you talk about ideas and you talk about creative thoughts and things, the key, the number one key characteristic of successful people, entrepreneurs, artists, anybody, is persistence. You know, it's persistence. You're going to get beat down. You're going to be told no a thousand times. Um, when we had Steve Wozniak at the Idea Festival a couple of years ago with the co-founder of Apple, one of his messages was, don't listen to what people say. <laughs> and that most of the time they don't know much more about it than you do. Uh, and um, um, Guy Kawasaki was one of the early Apple guys and started Garage.com. I, I heard him speak a number of years ago and he said something, I'm paraphrasing, 
but it's always actually meant a lot to me, and that is, he said, you know, don't worry about people buying your ideas. If it's a really good idea, you'll have to shove it down their throats. <laughs> actually, let me, let me just jump right on there, because I, I, um, I think you've hit a really important point. When you, when you uh, mistake ideas, thinking, often opinion, with action, I mean, they are actually different things. And so, you know, I can tell you there's no shortage of thinking. Clay Shirky's book, Cognitive Surplus, is about all of this extra creative intellectual energy. That is what it's about. When it comes to actually using it, applying it, the work, right, this is actually where all of the learning occurs. So, so when I say, hey, that's great, you want a stop sign on the corner or whatever, are you going to put that stop sign up? And it turns out nobody's going to put that sign up. You know, like, they, they wish, you know, the magic pixie will show up and put the stop sign up. So, so that's just not realistic. And it actually cheats everybody of the authenticity of closing the loop. So you actually only learn by doing. And, and the crazy thing is, I think all that I've learned about from and about social media is um, people are generally really poor judges of uh, how much time they spend thinking, commenting, sharing. Um, really poor, the poor judges of that amount of time, just like they were poor judges of how much Gilligan's Island they watched. Really poor judges of it. You know, and in the, in the end game, it was a big number, and it's an embarrassing number for Western civilization, right? Because it was one plot, one plot. We're starting out the island, Gilligan comes up with a way to get off the island, and it's spoiled at the last minute. Same freaking plot every time. So we didn't learn anything new by watching the Anchorman of Gilligan's Island episode, and then we watched it in reruns, so we could prove it and watch it again. So, so this line between thinking about commenting, rallying your friends around, and actually doing it is such an important line. And I worry greatly that we aren't good um, teachers about that line. And, it, and just, I'll just shut up in a second. Um, you know, we have, a, as a city, you know, we have a, a line you can call essentially to comment and complain. Right? It's a 311. You can ask good questions about when is the garbage going to be picked up. But it's often used to say, well, there's a pothole there, or that street sign's down over there, or whatever. Um, there's a lot of activity on that relative to the mayor's give a day site, mygiveaday.com, you know, where we want, oh, you know, 50,000 people to give a day uh, right around Derby, um, having a really hard time on the give a day. Now, I mean, relatively. Now, there are lots of folks who signed up, and I'm really grateful for that personally, um, but it is the difference to me. Right? So, you know, if you're not going to do, you, we really have to question um, the, the quality of the thing. We need both, but I think do is a good place to learn. The action network. And just to, um, before it goes away, the moment about the power of millions of people, just in, in praise of theater. I mean, theater is, is small, like in its very nature. Even if it's a 2,000 street uh, seat house, it, it, it cannot compare to 15 million people around the world tuning in in one moment. And I, I just feel like that can be uh, us being really jealous and, and try to find ways to kind of become that. But I also feel like there is a great power in just small amount of people sharing experience. And we do that really well. And that has meaning. So I just don't want us to leave thinking that somehow this act is not something that's very important in the midst of all of that. Um, I, I had a, I wanted to, I'm so glad you said that. Um, I think in this discussion of uh, technology and Facebook and Twitter, and believe me, I, I over-tweet. I uh, have maybe a problem with that. But um, to me, that, that is what, you know, Broadway commercial theater tries, in, in my humble opinion, too much to be the movie. You know, Spider-Man, right. we had that whole debacle, they're trying to compete with CGI, and I think the reason uh, one of the reasons people love theater um, and have are drawn to it for centuries is that it is real time and different from, it's separated from the technology, it's not virtual, it's real, happening in front of you now. There are real people in front of you and I think there's a danger in trying to compete with technology or try to, to copy it, to be a facsimile, which I see a lot of theater doing today, trying to compete with um, the film or the computer, um, there's, there's a, a difference that people are drawn to about the theater. There, there never has been nor will there ever be a, any substitute for experience, you know, and uh, that direct experience 
is is powerful. Not that mass media can't be powerful, but um, you know, for the I'll just say you know 90, 100. For, let's say there's 100 people in, in attendance currently. These 100 people, uh, along with all of us on stage, will later say we were there because we are. Um, for those tuning in via webcast, uh, they are getting the information, but they won't say we were there, and uh, and they won't, you know, feel literally the the you know the breath of others around them, and they they won't inevitably have the uh, conversation uh, once this is over and off in the air uh, that you know we will have continuously, uh, you know, once once this is once this is done. Uh, I, I think crowdsourcing, uh, you know, social media, mass media, it's all, it is not action. It is uh, a catalyst for change and a catalyst for action, but it's only a springboard. It's just where it begins. If you look back, you know, into history, um, you know, there, there was a time on Earth uh, referred to as an axial period where Confucius, Lao Tzu, Siddhartha Gautama, Mahavir, I believe Plato, Pythagoras, amongst others, all lived at the exact same time on this planet. Um, and uh, we may very well be moving into that uh, exciting time of, of thought and of, uh, and of change and of you know, groundbreaking philosophy uh, at this very moment. Uh, it, the, the difference is, is that through technology, um, you know, at that time, the only way to have shared that, that information would be a very long trek across mountains. Uh, we, we can share that all over the world immediately now with some of our greatest minds. Um, and it is a catalyst for change. But uh, the action has to come from the people. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, I had, a, I had a question about, you know, when you talk about crowdsourcing, it sounds new. But I think the guy with no hair mentioned the idea of local. <laughs> so if you take crowdsourcing and you think local, what you're basically talking about is civics. So it is about civic engagement. So then the question to the guy with no hair again is... Yeah, yeah. Does, well, yeah. We call that too, but... <laughs> it sounds so much better than the guy with no hair. <laughs> but does the city know who has no voice in the crowdsourcing. My guess is 60% of Louisville, I'm not from Louisville, has no voice. So how do they get this voice? So is there an interest index, an involvement index, or something like this? Now, I actually think Louisville, knowing how involved people are, how many access points to be involved, that's actually a marketing thing for Louisville, for outside it. It's a marketing thing for Kentucky or any place. But nobody knows this, and I'm only, I'm asking this question because I'm up in Bloomington, Indiana, and I'm asking them the same questions. Nobody knows. Who doesn't have a voice? Well, let me look at me. I'll stay with the man hair for a while. So, um, you know, I think there's this interesting um, challenge here for us. So, if I look at, um, the interest that people have in the community. It turns out you have to really have a conversation. I like the point earlier about this is kind of an intimate gathering here. Um, you know, this is human scale. And I spent two years in Washington, D.C. before I came back here. Um, and like Manhattan, it is a place that when you walk and you arrive, you are anonymous immediately. I mean, absolutely anonymous. And you would need to work hard to uh, build a sense of this is my village, right? I know these people, and I know what they do, and I know how this place works, and what the businesses are, and where the churches are, and all that kind of stuff. You know, Louisville is probably the smallest big city you can have, right? This is a community where you can know pretty much where all the neighborhoods are without a whole lot of work. And you can understand who the <coughs> civic leaders are, and you can understand these things without working really hard. And then what's even better is that you can actually participate. So I often think of sort of the difference between, you know, the sort of, uh, sort of semi-pro college sports and intramural sports. So, you know, this is an intramural town. Everybody can play soccer if they want to play. Everybody can be in community theater if they want to be. It's actually true. And it's, and it's easy to do. 
And so one of the things that I struggle with while I uh, take a paycheck to pay uh, a taxpayer um, is <clears throat> how do we make the most of that store? Because that's actually the story. It's not we're a better Indianapolis. That's right. You know, we're not a better Indianapolis. Um, you know, we are a special place. And we work at human scale. And that has to be an advantage. You know, and we, we should work hard to make that part of the way that we really understand where we live. And that's where our technology can really help us, though, uh, Ted, is that um, building platforms. This is where social media, where we can, as Jan was mentioning a second ago, where we have the virtual and the real collide, which is one of the things for the future, is how do we mitigate those? The state, the city, the government has more control over the real. Citizens have more control right now over the virtual. And merging those two together is one of the ways where we can find out more voices. And that's one of the things why it makes me hopeful is that we will build new platforms. We have time for one more question. Yes, sir, back. You had a question? Oh, I wanted to drill down on libraries. Okay. <laughs> as, a place where, as a place where gears grind in this transition. Um, you, um, li libraries came into existence when um, it was possible to accumulate a certain critical mass of human knowledge in one place where people could go to and consume it and, and digest it and, and talk on maybe other ideas. They were um, hugely important in the growing literacy of this country, all of that. We know the benefits of libraries. What about now? Well, there are a few public spaces in cities. Oh, I'm, I'm not questioning the value of libraries. Oh. Where, if the internet achieves its full potential, the dissemination of information through it will far surpass what the average local library is. So then how does the library add value? Are they really a place where people gathered it? I, I think that, yeah, I think with all of the things we're talking about in the theater, I thought it was an excellent uh, commentary. Um, being authentic, creating a place for yourself in the world, being competitive, and competitive is not a bad word, whether you're an artist or that just means, doesn't necessarily mean money, but it means being out there, means that I think all of us have to realize we have to reinvent ourselves. The library is going to have to reinvent itself or it will become obsolete. Everybody, that's true of, of everybody uh, in today's world. If you can't change with the times, you're going to become obsolete. That doesn't mean getting away from what you do. It doesn't mean, um, it doesn't mean you know, forgetting your soul, whether you're a company or an artist. It doesn't mean that at all. But it does mean, and it does, it means being unique. You know, it, it's simply, yeah, simply um, trying to replicate a movie is not unique. That's, gee, that's probably the fastest way to obsolescence, as opposed to figuring out what can we do that's authentic, what can we do that people will value, and how do we do it perhaps differently without perverting what we're doing. But I, I do believe that fundamentally, um, we all in this world, everything, every, you know, in, in biology, everything changes. Things that don't evolve die. And that's, that's the nature of the beast. Things that don't evolve, you know, ultimately disappear. And I think this, this world, and, and for every, you know, for every action, there's a reaction. One of the troubling things, and for every good, there's a, there's a, you know, one of the troubling things I read recently, for example, was that a lot of gyms are having problems surviving in today's world. And the reason is not because people don't want to work out, but gyms were a, people, were a place where people would work out and gather and talk. And now people come in with their iPhones, right? They're in their iPhones, their iPads. They go work out. They're on their own little world. They don't talk to anybody, and they leave. And, and so that so the question then becomes okay well how do we become you know, how do we you know maybe I don't know how do you do that but I'm just saying that I think that that fundamentally the question is we all have to figure out uh, uh, ways of changing or you know we're not going to we're not going to, to survive one more quick comment I'll ask everybody up there one more last thing to say because I know we're done um, we talk about information we talk about Twitter and all these things knowing isn't the same thing as understanding and, and simply. Knowing something or reading a headline or knowing that we're going looking at, you know, perhaps bonding or Iran for something isn't the same thing as really understanding it and understanding the context of it. And that will, you know, that will never be lost. And, and that's the other thing we have to guard against. One quick comment for everybody, and then I know we're, we're done. I think we're actually over. So, quick, quick comment. As a, that's a powerful microphone. <laughs> As a Marine Corps veteran, I'd like to say that, um, really, please permit me to speak in, in, in a large metaphor here, but uh, I, I believe that, um, well, I'll kick this off actually by saying there's a Hopi Indian word, um, it's 
Koi Anaskasi, which was made into a film by Godfrey Reggio uh, and Philip Glass. But Koi Anaskasi, loosely translated in the English language, means life as war. And um, living is a battle. Um, and, but it's, it's a battle worth fighting for. And we are all warriors. And as a warrior in the 21st century, I urge all of us to, uh, with the most authenticity that you can muster up with, from within, to merge your inner technology, meaning your heart, with your outer technology and, and, uh, and spread that around. Love is always where everything begins. It's the most important thing. Technology or not. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> From the Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, listen, I just, uh, first of all, thank you for hosting us today. I want to just share briefly with this audience that uh, part of the IF University, uh, we're going to launch something. Uh, you may have read it. I wrote a piece about it in the Courier Journal uh, a few days ago. And uh, you're going to see something that percolates around the city. It'll be on the Kentucky, um, on the uh, Center for Performing Arts, that billboard. You'll see it on various billboards around the city as well as in Lexington. And there will be questions that will be probing uh, the future. They're going to be designed to create, to help nudge us toward a new way of thinking about the future. So it's a new platform, a crowdsourcing idea of where we hope to get six or 800,000 people responding to various questions about the future. And uh, we think it has a very powerful potential to uh, engage a much larger number of people using some of that cognitive surplus. So we're going to actually do an experiment with crowdsourcing as part of the IF University. Look for it. All right. Um, I would be embarrassed if I didn't leave without making a plug for one of the most important things that I think we're going to do as a community. And that is um, we're pushing into a 25-year vision for the city of Louisville. And there are lots of ways that that could be done. Um, we could have a, a handful of city employees in a conference room for two weeks and they could produce such a plan. Uh, it probably wouldn't be very good. Or, uh, or we could all be involved. And we could get the community that we want. And I think these are uh, special opportunities. I will tell you what I'm bringing to that exercise is actually the happy ending to the zoo story with Google Maps. And that is, we have failed to recognize in our, our sort of expertise and zeal for urban planning and all this, we have failed to recognize this sort of digital layer that sort of is, hangs above it all. And guess what? There's no city in the world that has a digital urban plan. So we will be the first community to actually take this seriously and say, well, where am I? And how are the ways I can know where I am? And uh, we can't ignore the things that much younger folks actually expect to work. Right? They expect it. You know? There is no such thing as a dead structure anymore. There's a structure with extra stuff that we can know about it. So uh, I'm very excited about that. So please get involved. You'll be hearing more about it shortly. And uh, it'll be better with you than without you. First of all, just thank you, Actors Theatre, for bringing me back. And, <laughs> and then uh, just to kind of close out the exercise of you all telling stories, you, um, that is something that we all can do every moment. You know, you, we can leave this theater and be the person who crossed a boundary in somebody else's story. Uh, so I just encourage us all to do that. And I'll pick up on two points. One, the experience. We are humans. We like experiences. You know, in the old days, the only time you could experience theater or music was to go to a performance. There was no recordings. There was no radio, no TV. And now I feel like, you know, music, I have more songs, you know, on this little thing than most people probably ever heard a thousand, you know, 200 years ago. And the only thing that is special, I think, about experiencing music and plays is the experience and being there in person again. So we kind of come full circle. And the second thing about the people that have a voice, I think Louisville's a great place. I think everybody can move the needle, does have a voice here, but a lot of people don't realize they do. And so how do we educate them to feel empowered to speak up? to band together uh, and then make this kind of a more socially equitable city. So on behalf of Actors Theater and the Humana Festival of New Berkeley Place, thank you very much. Thank Thanks you. Very much.